chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter number 3. And I guess it's the idea that when things is all said and done, when she's wrapped up, you ought to have some joy with what God has done in your life, things that have happened in your life, uh, how real and precious the Lord has been to you. Things all said and done. There are discouragements in the Christian life. There are the, the pros and the cons. There's the ups and the downs, uh, the mountain peaks and the valleys and everything in between, most of it being routine. But when it's all done, finally, when it's all done, you want to make sure you've got a lot to rejoice and you can rejoice in the Lord. All right, Paul gets talking about his salvation now and talking about what he uh, counts as worthless, nothing, and lost, and glad to lose it, uh, to gain the Lord Jesus Christ. Talks about gain, talks about loss. And, of course, he loses all things, and he says, uh, For the uh, excellency, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, in uh, chapter 3, verse 8, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. All right, then he's on top, but he might uh, not have the religious stature that he once had. He might not have the... Uh, the tags that he once had, the badges he once had, if you want to call it that. Uh, he says, I've got the Lord. Likewise with you and I. Uh, this world may not look at you and I as very much at all, but if you've got the Lord, uh, you're a winner, you're on top, you have gained. Uh, the words are gain, loss, loss, win. He says that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Nothing we have. Uh, nothing God's impressed with we've ever done simply has to do with the righteousness of Jesus Christ being given to us, being imputed to us. And then he goes on says, uh, being saved, he says, I'm still not willing to stop there. Want to know him? Know him personally as your Savior. But he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. Now go back to Second Peter chapter 3. In Second Peter chapter 3, I look at verse number 18. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Peter talks about knowing the Lord, growing, and then knowing the Lord more and more as time goes on. All right, but grow in grace. Last verse of 2 Peter 3. Uh, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right, Paul talks along the same lines. It's like you know him as your Savior. You're saved. And he says, but I want to know a little bit more about him. I want to know him better. I want to know something about uh, some power, some of his power in my life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, notice what goes hand in hand with it. You're going to get to know the Lord better. There's some things you're going to have to know. You're going to have to know uh, something about some power of God in your life. And as well as that, uh, you're going to have to know something about some sufferings. And they go hand in hand. The fellowship of his sufferings, and that's the side that nobody wants. Everybody wants the power. Everybody wants to be... Uh, have God all over them, but they're afraid of the fellowship of his sufferings. Uh, nobody likes it, but you go through it. You're called upon to go through it. And uh, when you go through it, just remember, uh, it seems as though that God uses somebody greater after they go through suffering. The greater the suffering, the greater God uses them, the uh, less of the world in them, the more of God in them. And it seems as though that if God ever really, really uses somebody, he's got to absolutely destroy the world for them and put them through the mill, let them go through something, uh, permit them to go through something, not that he puts them through it, but permit them to go through something. And the Bible says, being made conformable unto his death. All right, down to verse number 11. In verse number 11, he says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. All right, if by any means. Now look uh, back at verse number 7. Verse number 8 gets talking about all things. All right, then if he's going to know something about this power, know something about the real thing, know something about God and his life, then he's going to have to, he's going to, have to face the loss of all things. All right, for salvation, number one, but also for the power of God in his life, uh, the loss of all things, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Oh, I said, now he hasn't attained to the level he's shooting for. He hasn't uh, attained to the, I guess you might say, the fellowship with the Lord that he desires, the power of God that he desires. Uh, he has uh, something he's shooting for, but he says, I haven't attained it yet. When it comes to salvation, he's got that. When it comes to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he's attained that. But as far as knowing the Lord like he wants to know him, as far as the power of God in his life like he'd like to have it, as far as fellowship with the Lord uh, through thick or through thin uh, that he would desire, he says, I haven't attained unto that, but he said, I'm willing. If by any means, whatever it takes, losing everything, he said, I'm willing for it. All right, now as all I had already attained, still something out ahead that I'm shooting for, either already perfect. Now as far as before God, uh, he is perfect. As far as before God, he talks about people being saints. Go back to chapter 1, look at verse number 1. Philippians 1 and verse 1. All right, you're standing in Jesus Christ. It will be absolute sinless perfection. 
Uh, that's given to you as far as your standing, but now he gets talking about his state. And, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, the bishops and deacons. All right, if those people, if their state was absolute sinless perfection, and if they were saints uh, as far as their condition, there'd be no need for Paul to write to them and even write a letter to them. But uh, because there is something he's still trying to attain to, something that you and I need to attain to, their standing may be perfect, uh, but their state, there's still something to attain unto. Oh, it says, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Oh, it's like as though that I've got something I'm striving for, something I'm after, something I'm going after and shooting for. And he says, not on that, he says, Christ Jesus is trying to do something to me as well. He says, I'm ap- uh, that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's after me, and I'm after him. I want him, and he wants me. It's that sort of thing. All right, he wants you to such an extent. Look at chapter 1, verse number 6. Chapter 1, and verse number 6. Being called for this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. All right, then he's after. He's trying to do something with you. He's trying to do something in you. Look at chapter 2, and verse number 13. Chapter 2, and verse number 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right, then he's after you, and he wants you to do right. He's after you to be a blessing to him. I want you to be a pleasure to him. He wants you to do the things that are right. All right, you want more of him, and he wants more of you. That's kind of the statement there, Paul, in verse number 12. All right, it says, uh, I've suffered the loss of all things and glad to do it. He said, I've gained. I've gained Jesus Christ. He says, now I'm looking for more than that. He said, I want to know him better. He said, in effect, he said, I want to know something about his power. And I want to be in real close fellowship with him. And he says, to do that, uh, he says, I've got to be made conformable unto his death. And he says, I've got to keep on pushing the right direction. Well, I'd follow after. And he says, he's after me. I'm after him. I want him. I want all that I can get. All right, number 13. Brother, I caught not myself to have apprehended. All right, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth on those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All right, then along one line he has attained. In one area he's attained. It'd be like some of you all, you've got strong points. You've got a point that uh, you're real good at. Uh, Paul not satisfied with just one area, but he says, I do have one thing right. Uh, you have some people who don't have anything right. Some people, only a bottom is they've gotten saved. They haven't gone any further. They haven't grown in the Lord. They haven't had any fellowship with the Lord. They don't fellowship with the Lord. They don't know the power of God in their life. Uh, they never have known much of that in their life. Uh, they haven't gone very far. Paul says, I've got a lot I'm shooting for. I haven't attained what I, uh, the level that I'm trying to uh, reach. But he says, I've got one area in which I've got it right. And he says, this area, he says, uh, is this, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And he says, I'm shooting and shooting for the top. I'm not necessarily concerned about how it goes here. I'm concerned about how it goes on the other side. Now, this business about forgetting the, those things which are behind. Now, you know, a lot of people have a hard time with it. You know, sometimes uh, the things back there, they're, they're good. And you have people that uh, they, don't, they couldn't give you a testimony of something God done the past week if the life depended on it. Uh, all they've got is a testimony of something that took place 15, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, sometimes they go clear back to World War No. 2 about something God did in World War No. 2. And it's as though there's a great big old blank between then and now. And uh, Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Uh, sometimes those things are a blessing to you, but you don't just live back there. And likewise, uh, the back there are sometimes discouragements, and sometimes they're defeats, and sometimes there are things back there that, uh, that maybe you blundered. Maybe someone else blundered as far as you're concerned. Uh, Paul said, I've got one thing right. He said, forgetting those things which are behind. Uh, now, I'll take your Bible and look at a couple places. Look at Genesis chapter 19. Notice a great problem not being able to forget that which is behind. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 26. Genesis 19, verse 26. Now, you know the story of uh, Lot there and uh, his family. And uh, the angel of the Lord commands that this place is going to be destroyed. They need to get out of the city. And uh, he had to drag him out of the city. And then not only that, uh, fire and brimstone coming down. His wife still not satisfied and still had the hankering to go back. And the Bible said in verse number 26, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And, you know, bad news. I guess one of the great lessons you learn is sometimes you just go on and forget that which is behind. 
I remember one time hearing a fellow and, and uh, or being around a fellow, and uh, somebody asked this fellow in relation to what he had done before, and I guess probably 10 years of his life included this particular kind of a job. And then he come to a time in his life when uh, he was called to make a complete change. And somebody said to him, said, Doesn't it, uh, don't you miss that which was back there? He said, don't you, uh, you know, desire to go back to what you, what you uh, were into before? And he said, something I learned when I was in the Army. He said, when I was in the Army, he said, I learned whenever I went from base to base, I packed my bags and I went from one spot to another, I just forgot what was back there. And he said, same way in the Christian life. He said, I've been called upon to make complete change as far as it was just an occupation, as far as uh, his occupation was complete change. And he says, I'll just leave that which is back there. And what I've learned in the Army, he said, I'll just leave that thing back there and I'll go on and do the best I can at the next job that I've got. Forgetting those things which are behind. And sometime a Christian's got to do that. I'll take your Bible and go to the book of Genesis, look chapter number 41. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. I'll show you what help what will help make you forget that which is behind. Genesis chapter 41. All right, chapter 41. Joseph in Egypt. And verse number 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn. This is his sons now. Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. That's an amazing thing that someone like Joseph in Egypt uh, could forget what happened. Now you think about all his father's house, you think about those brothers. You think about how those brothers treated him, they envied him. Uh, they didn't like him from day one. They didn't appreciate Joseph. And uh, they sold the Midianites going to, into Egypt there. And he says, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Now that's an amazing statement. All right, verse number 52. And the name of the second called Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Or right, if you want to know how to forget those things that are behind, just keep on going, just keep on doing right. And God's going to make you to be fruitful. It may not be of your choice where you're at and what you're doing, but God will enable you to be fruitful. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't make any difference where you're at, as long as you're bearing fruit, as long as God's doing something with you. I seem like everything else can go by the board. Nothing else is too, uh, doesn't mean too much, not too, of too great a significance whenever you're being fruitful. And if, you, if you're fruitful for the Lord, then you can be sure as well as that you'll be able, like Joseph, to forget all your toil and all your father's house. That's a good trait. It's a remarkable trait. Paul says, I've got a level I'm shooting for. I haven't attained to it. I don't profess to have attained to it. I've got one area right. I'm going to keep on pressing for some more, but I've got one area right. I'm able to forget uh, those things that are behind. Now, I'll take your Bible, go back to the book of Hebrews, and look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, look down about verse number 15. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse number 15. Verse number 13 talks about uh, these old-time saints. Uh, the Bible says they confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have return. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for it is prepared for them a city. You know what those saints did? You know what kept them going? You know why they all died in the faith? And they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the, this earth because they had their eyes heavenward. Uh, the Bible says they desired a better country and heavenly country. And the Bible says uh, they were not mindful of uh, the country from whence they came out or they would have returned. And a good idea for you and a good idea for me, just forget the things that are behind, the places that are behind, uh, the situations that are behind, the victories and the defeats that are behind, the occupations that are behind, and press forward and be fruitful for the Lord, and God will give you victory, and God will enable you to forget the things that are behind. Forget my toil, and he said, God's also enabled me to forget all my Father's house. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. All right, I said, I've got more to go, so I'm not done yet. I'm pressing on. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You're not looking for the path of least resistance. He's pressing on. He's pressing on. However the thing goes, he's concerned about one thing. He's concerned about how things wrap up when it's all said and done. Not concerned about right now. He's concerned about how, how the thing comes out when she's done. He says, I'm looking for a prize. He said, I'm, I desire the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not sure about all that, but I'll show you what it looks like. Again, take your Bible. This time, go to Luke chapter 14. 
Luke chapter 14. It looks like one time, one, uh, at one point in time, you and I get out to the resurrection of the just. It looks as though that there's uh, a level you can attain unto as far as the Lord saying, uh, in effect, friend, come up higher. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse number, I'll oh, make it verse number 7. Luke 14, 7. And he, Jesus, put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest rooms. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and him that humbleth himself, uh, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Okay, it looks like a situation down about verse number 14. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. All right, then one day the payoff is coming. And Paul says, I'll put everything in the past. He says, I'm going to press on. He says, I'm going to forget what's behind. I'm going to press on. I'm going to reach forth. I'm going to keep on going. And he says, I'm going to do it for a reason. He says, I'm looking for a prize. And he says, I'm looking for a prize. And this prize he calls uh, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Then evidently, at the resurrection of the just, one day you're going to be repaid. And what you want is a place of stature, not here. A place of elevation and exaltation, not here. But a place that he gives you. And the Bible says that that'll be later on. And Paul says, that's the prize I'm looking for. All right, now as well as that, Paul talks about prizes, and evidently he considers the Lord to be a rewarder. And you and I need to be likewise the same thing. Uh, you know, parents have to do it with their children. Children do, children do right, and sometimes you give them their allowance. Uh, sometimes they go the second mile of the way and do things beyond the call of duty or obligation, and uh, sometimes they can stand a reward, a ward. Daily Vacation Bible School, uh, we have three or four different awards that we give unto them. Uh, we give to them for perfect attendance, carrying the Bibles, memory work, uh, different things. I forget exactly what they are. Uh, but they get awards. And uh, the Lord does the same thing. And you need to, need to consider that uh, sometimes just parents with children. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul's interested in the prizes that are on the other side. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24. 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. All right, then you push, you shove, you strive. Uh, not a matter of just automatically attaining the prize. I guess nowadays we have some things where uh, nobody loses, everybody seems to get a prize. Uh, but not that way with the Lord. You're going to have to strive for it, you're going to have to work for it, it'll be the payoff. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Or I pertain to the ministry uh, for myself, for what you have uh, as far as a ministry. What you want to do is keep your body under and keep it in subjection and strive for the mastery and strive for an incorruptible crown. Or right, the Lord's got prizes. Uh, in verse number 14 here, he talks about the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about an incorruptible crown, and you're able to obtain both of those. All right, verse number 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now you're standing sinless perfection because you've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ, your state. And he's talking about your state now. All right, as many therefore as be perfect. Along the lines of verse number 13 and verse number 14, all right, be thus minded. And if, any, and if in any other thing ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now, of course, you, you never attain unto perfect, uh, perfect sinless perfection. Uh, you never attain uh, all that you would desire to attain. Sometimes it's about to get you down. I remember one time I went for a period of months, and it seemed like as though that uh, uh, wasn't like there was sin in my life, but it seemed like that what I was shooting for, what I desired, a close fellowship with the Lord, uh, a relationship there that I guess I can't even hardly put in words. It seemed like I, I couldn't quite get it. And one day I was reading my Bible and the Lord gave me a verse. A uh, verse back in Romans chapter 8 and I guess about verse 3 or verse 4 there. Uh, I'll read it to you. Romans 8 and verse 3. For what the law could not do and that was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And uh, my desire was right, and I was walking after the spirit. It's just that, you know what, you and I really would like, we just never quite attain to. It seemed though that even sometimes the peak times in your life when it comes to spirituality, it seemed like you never quite attain all that you desire. And uh, Paul was that way. He said, I haven't attained. He said, I'm after more. I want more. And he said, uh, the Lord wants more out of me. He said, I'm going to keep on pressing on. All right, uh, as many as be perfect. He said, I've got one area right. Now I'll show you another area that you can get right. You won't get it all the way. You won't attain sinless perfection. Uh, but you won't be condemned if you walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Uh, if you would, take your Bible look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Another area. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 45. Make it 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father's your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. All right, along these lines, along the lines of impartiality, you can be perfect. All right, in what? You know, not everybody likes you. And some people, they don't even, uh, they not only dislike you, the Bible says uh, they even hate you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them, which despitefully use you and persecute you. All right, along certain lines, you're to show impartiality. The context is impartiality. I mean... It rained yesterday on some people's uh, property that needed rain, that thumb their nose at the Lord, thumb their nose at the Word of God, uh, don't want anything to do with the Lord, uh, care nothing about the Word of God, and Lord gave rain to them as well as he gave it to you and I. Likewise, the sunshine. They got sunshine, you got sunshine. You know what that is? That's an impartial God. He's no respecter of persons. Now, sometimes you do have a land of Goshen. Sometimes he might uh, give you an added blessing. Uh, but God is an impartial God. Along those lines, you and I can be the same. Be therefore perfect, even as you're not, not sinlessly perfect, but in this area, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Oh, right, I take another area. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and this time look at, uh, make it verse 9. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of, the, of those nations. There shall not be found among you any that make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all these things, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. All right, along the lines of verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. As uh, far as the uh, familiar spirits, spirit of divination, whatever it might be, you and I pay no attention to it. Uh, you do not go to a fortune teller. You go to the Word of God. You want to know about the future? Uh, you get the future and the details from the Word of God. You don't fool around with tea leaves, crystal balls, lines in the palm of somebody's hand. Uh, you don't fool around with a charmer, uh, anything of that nature. Anybody use any kind of divination, chicken livers, whatever it might be, crystal ball. Uh, you don't fool around with any of that. Along those lines, you're to be perfect. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. All right, now this time come back to the book of Job. Come a step further now, come back to the book of Job. Sinless perfection you won't attain. Impartiality you can get, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth you can get. Uh, as far as laying away from divination, which this world now is going crazy over, and familiar spirits, you can lay off of that, but sinless perfection you won't attain too. And if you would, you wouldn't know your own soul. All right, Job chapter 9, this time verse 20. Job 9 and verse 20. 
Job 9.20, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I'm perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul, I would despise my life. So whenever somebody tells you that they're perfect and they've attained unto sinless perfection, it's somebody that doesn't even know their own soul and doesn't even know their own heart. You know what your heart's really like? Like anybody else. You know what Jeremiah said about it? Deceitful above all things. The most deceitful thing you have is your own heart. Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what, know what he's saying? It's indication that you don't really know your own heart. You don't know how, you say, I'm truthful, I'm honest, I'd, I'd never be deceitful over anything. You don't know your heart. Like a fellow told me, you know, we was talking about, and he's saying, he looked at the stock market, and I don't know anything about stock markets, because, you know, that really is not my interest. And, uh, you know, I don't have, uh, I have nothing in stock markets, so I don't know one thing about it. And uh, like, uh, you know, like you say, the, like to say the, the best thing to invest in is that which you can't see. But anyhow, uh, this guy, fellow, he's looking at the stock market, said, man, look at that thing. And uh, he was reading that thing off, and it was like 2,600, 26,000, 26 points, 26 something or other, 26, uh, 2,640. He said, man, he said, you realize that a couple years ago when that stock market crashed, that market was at 2,700, and he named, uh, he named the numbers. And he said, right now, this is just past week, he said, right now, I said, we're at 2,640. In other words, you're, within a, you're not too far off of what proved to be the crash of, what, October 1986 or 85 or whenever it was. And, uh, you know, he, he looked at that thing and said, that's an amazing thing. And we got talking. I got talking about some guy that I knew. And this guy, he played in the stock market. And I, I figure it's all fixed. You know, some guys, they figure uh, baseball's fixed. And Pete Rose might lead you to think it is. And somebody else says, I don't follow football because it's all fixed. And maybe it is. I don't know. I don't follow stock markets because it's fixed. <laughs> I don't have the money either. But anyhow, uh, in relation to it, uh, the fellow, he, he got talking about, uh, I got telling about a guy that I knew, and he, he said he wasn't guilty, but what they had, they found out that right before, a day before this, the bottom foul of these one stocks, uh, he switched the thing over to something or other, and, and he gained, I forget how much he gained, he, he gained, I guess they gained $100,000 in one shot like that, or maybe more than that, uh, just kind of round numbers, just tossing out a number for you. But anyhow, uh, they fined him $66,000 said, not guilty. But he said, it cost me that much to fight the thing, and I don't feel like paying attorney's fees. We'll just say I'm guilty, I'll pay the fine. Now, you can take that for what it's worth. But you know those guys that have the inside track, they don't want the bonds ready to fall out, so they switch everything over and invest in this thing or get out of this thing here, and, you know, they become multi-millionaires over it. And uh, this fellow said, well, I said, uh, I don't want to condemn the guy because I said, I'll tell you what, he said, I don't have a lot, but I've got a few stocks. And he said, I'd like to think that I'd be smart enough before a thing crashes, I'd change it from one another, know where to change it to. And he said, you know, we're supposed to be Christian. We say we wouldn't do this. But he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be tempted along those lines, knowing that the bond's going to fall out, and I could invest over here and make some money. And he said, I, you know, he said, I wouldn't want to be tempted along those lines. I don't know what I'd do. You know what he's saying? He said, I don't even know more. I know I'm saved. He said, I'm a Christian. I know what I say I do. But he said, you know, if the temptation's great enough, I'm not sure what I'd do. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See? And uh, whenever somebody tells you that they've attained under a level of sinless perfection, they don't know their own heart. There's a fellow who lives over about a block away from Irvin, a block or two away. And I don't know what he's like now, but I know that in about a five-year interval of going to his home, uh, I went to him one time, and I forget who was with me, but knocked on the door, and this fellow, I said, I said, have you, my opening statement was kind of unusual that day, and I don't know why, I guess just filled my Cheerios, and I said, have you ever seen yourself lost? And he said, I don't usually ever say that, you know, I'll make it a little bit easier, but I said, have you ever seen yourself lost? And the guy said, yeah, I have. And I said, what did you do about it? And he said, I got saved. I said, well, good, how'd you get saved? He went on and said, he got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then I said, well, are you living for the Lord? And that fellow went on and tell me he was sinlessly perfect. And I said, you are sinlessly perfect. And I went on and, uh, and, you know, talked about some inward sins. Now, you know, not just smoking, drink, you know, drinking, dancing, cursing, that kind of thing. I got talking to him about, you know, a little bit of envy and a little bit of pride. 
and things like that. And no matter what I put on this guy, and we went out for about 20 minutes, no matter what I put on him, this fellow still, I mean, he, the sworn truth was, man, I've got it all right, and I am absolutely sinlessly perfect. It came, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't budge him a fraction. Okay, the thing, you know, so finally I left, and it didn't matter to me. I, you know, I understood how it went. And uh, about, I guess, uh, say somewhere around five years later, we went back to the neighborhood, and we're going down the different streets there and getting close to wrapping up, getting on, you know, sort of dark, about 8.30, 9 o'clock. And uh, we were all standing at the corner of one of the streets, I think Beverly, and say about 33rd. And we were waiting, and uh, Jim Brislin and somebody else was still, they were talking to somebody. And I thought, well, what are those guys going to do, man? Are they going to have iced tea, ice cream, or what? Are they going to have ice cream social? What's going on here? And we waited, you know, and pretty soon the street lights came on. We're still waiting, and they're talking, talking, talking. And uh, finally they came back and said, man, did you have something going? I said, no, I wouldn't have nothing going. So that guy there claims he's sinlessly perfect. You know, that guy five years later still has the wild idea that he's sinlessly perfect. And Job said, if I was, he said, I wouldn't know my own soul. So the idea is this, the closer you get to God, the less you really realize it. And the more you see of him, the more you realize that I'm a crud. As a matter of fact, I'm not only a sinner, a saved sinner, but I'm chief of sinners. And he said, I wouldn't know my own soul. I would despise my life. But you don't quit because you can't attain unto it. You keep going for another level. All right? Forgetting those things which are behind. You got it? Or some of y'all still wanting to go back. Go back. Go back to the country you came out. You know where you came out of? You came out of Egypt. You know what's back there? You say, oh yeah, man. Fishes and cukes and leeks and, and melons and garlic. And, yeah, I want to go back. Uh, let me tell you something. You know what's back there? Bondage. You know what Egypt is? It's the house of bondage. And being mindful of country for once, you better forget about it. You better be thankful that, brother, you're heading for a heavenly country, and you better forget the one you came out of and go on to the next stop, and that will be glory very shortly. All right, you can attain to that level. You can attain to the level of impartiality. You know, sometimes do you good to, to be a blessing to somebody can do you no good. They can do you no good at all. As a matter of fact, that passage back in Luke chapter 14 we looked at, I skipped a couple of verses in there, but those verses there, uh, talking about uh, inviting somebody over and calling somebody to a supper uh, that cannot call you to one. They got nothing to offer you, and, and they can't recompense you or pay you back. All you can do is something for them. They can do nothing for you, and you wait for your payback on the other side, and you get to the judgment. You can attain to that level of impartiality. You can attain to the level of perfection of going only to the Word of God, measuring everything by the Word of God, uh, knowing about the future only by what God says in His Word, and no more, no less. Not trying to stretch anything, not going by feeling, not going by familiar spirits, uh, not going by crystal balls or any form of divination at all. You can attain to that level. But sinless perfection, Job said, if you ever get that thing right, you won't even know it. And a matter of fact, you won't get it right until you get your new body. So you just keep on trying to attain and you apprehend him. And you try to get to know him better than you've ever known him before in your Christian life. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. All right, verse 15 again. Verse 15. He said, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now our standing is perfection and certain areas we can attain it. Be thus minded. If in any other thing you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now down to the end of verse number 16, let us mind the same thing. And oh, about another one, uh, verse number 19, who mind earthly things. All right, then your mind ought to be a certain direction. And your mind ought to be heavenward. Your mind ought to be the judgment seat of Christ. Your mind ought to be concerned about a prize you can get when you hit that judgment. All right, 16, nevertheless, we, where to we have already attained... Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. We've attained one area. All right, we, uh, we walk by the same. That's good for one, good for all. Let us mind the same thing. All right, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Now, Paul's saying, follow me, follow me. He said, uh, 
I'm as close to God. I'm trying to get as close to God as I can. Follow me. Shoot for the same thing. I've got one area right. Try to attain that same area. Uh, You say, well, why follow him? Why not just follow the Lord? I guess the idea is sometimes we need we need an example. And you and I are to be in samples. I'm to be in sample to the flock, to you all in general. We're to be in samples one to another. Uh, Paul says, uh, you have, so as you have us for and in sample. Paul and Timothy, they're to be in samples unto the flock. Now, nothing wrong with following somebody. I mean, somebody first gets saved, they don't know what's right, they don't know what's wrong, they don't know which direction to go. Uh, been a lot of fog, been a lot of hangover from the old life. All right, find somebody who has something going for God and get in behind them. Follow them. Do what they do. They go to the street corner, go to the street corner. They knock on doors, knock on doors. They seem to have a prayer life, get you a prayer life. They live in the Word of God, live in the Word of God. They've got something going, or they can take a beating and keep on going. Uh, You be somebody like them. Follow somebody as long as they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. When they deviate or sidetrack, get to the right hand or the left, uh, then you have to deviate and you have to follow just the Lord. But you follow man and only as far as they follow the Lord. Uh, Look at a couple places in your Bible. Back up to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Yet he keeps on talking about following me. Why did he say that? Here he says, follow God. Oh, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. I'll be real clear. First Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be followers of me, even, even as I also am of Christ. All right, then as long as he is following the Lord, you're safe in following him. You can follow him that far, no further. No matter who it is, once they get sidetracked, uh, once they turn aside, then you cease to follow them. All right, it says, uh, you have us for an example. Now, something else that I need to say at this time, uh, you take someone like myself, take someone like yourself, you might be an example to, say, a new Christian, uh, someone who's younger in the Lord than what you are. You've been down the road a little bit further, you ought to be an example to them. I ought to show them some things and uh, the path in which they should walk. All right, likewise, I need to do the same for you all. Uh, if you're a follower of a man, then that man is a leader. And you know, you've got to, takes a leader. Somebody's got to lead the flock. I've got to lead and I've got to feed you. But I'm just a leader. I'm a shepherd, under shepherd. And I guide you with the skillfulness of my hands and the integrity of my heart. David was told to do that. And so I've got to guide you and lead you along the same lines. All right, Greg and I, we have a conversation about a week or so ago. And then we talk back and forth and say, Greg, I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about you. You've got something going. You're trying to do something for the Lord. You've tried to, you've tried to make a step out the road for the Lord. I'm concerned about you. You know what I want to do? Uh, listen, he's just a member of the church. You know what I want to do? I want to lead him aright. I don't want to lead him astray. And I don't want to lord it over him. I mean, he feels the call of God in his life like I feel the call of God in my life. All right, what am I? I'm not lord over him. I'm not lord over anybody here. I'm simply a leader. Now, I say that because in Christian circles and Baptist circles, you have a strong movement these days of, I guess you could call it lordship of the pastor over God's people. I mean, if you really measure the thing all the way down the line, that's the way the thing would come out. It's as though you can't make a move, you can't do anything without, first of all, coming to me. If you have a problem, you don't go to the Word of God, you come to me, first of all, I'll solve your problems for you. I'd hate to have my whole church bring every problem to me. Man, I'd go under in a week's time. Go to God. Go to the Word of God. Get something from God. And if you can't get something from God every now and then, maybe I can help you along. But to, to have everybody come to me with all their problems and saying, you don't have the right angle on unless, first of all, you've come to me and I've told you what to do, that'd be, a, that'd be a job and a half, I'll guarantee you. And because of that, you need to realize it's, a, it's kind of a sad thing. But someone like myself is a leader and an example, not a lord. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 
1 Peter 5, 1, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partake of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, not as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. A leader? Yes. A feeder? Yes. All right, an under shepherd? Yes. But not a lord. All right, and samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. All right, then uh, you and I need to think right along those lines. I need to think like, right, most definitely I need to do. And, of course, I'm not interested in being lord over anybody, uh, but I sure like to lead you the right direction. All right, number 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. All right, the, remember the context is spiritual living. And it looks as though that uh, here are a bunch of Christians here, and these Christians, they're, uh, they're concerned only about earthly things. Verse number 19, look at the end of the verse there. They're concerned just about earthly things. They're not concerned about heavenly things. They're not concerned about a prize, like verse number 14. Not concerned about the judgment seat of Christ. Not concerned about the power of God in their life. Not concerned about fellowship with the Lord. Not concerned about anything that has any reproach connected to it at all. You know what it mean to be a Christianity, similar to what you see on TV, a big old show. I mean, everybody, you know, uh, it's a, I guess you call it the gospel of prosperity, that type of thing. And the, what Paul's talking about here, he's talking about suffering. He's talking about going through something. He's talking about paying a price. He's talking about reaching forth to a level that I haven't attained unto yet, but not quitting. And letting the things in the past be in the past, but, attain, uh, but reaching on forth and trying to attain unto a higher level. He's talking about the real thing. He's talking about spiritual uh, living, and he's talking about the reproach even connected with it. He said all the... Uh, all the acclamation he said that thing as far as I'm concerned I lose it all uh, that stuff is all done he says I'm concerned about the Lord I'm concerned about uh, the power of the resurrection I'm concerned about God in my life all right many walk and not everybody desires to attain on the level that Paul wants you to attain to and he says I've told you time and time again he said uh, I'm tore up over it uh, he said I he said I tell you now even weeping now go back to Galatians chapter 4 and look at verse 16. Galatians 4, 16. It's 19. 4, 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. He's not talking about losing your salvation and getting saved again. He's talking about being yielded, lock, stock, and barrel, head to foot, being yielded to the Lord. And he says, I travail. You ladies can connect with that. This fellow, man, this fellow is tore up, absolutely tore up over their spiritual condition. And he says, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He's concerned with the, those at Philippi in chapter 3. He says, I tell you now, even weeping. And he said, some of these people, they're, they're not concerned. They're not concerned at all about Christian, real Christianity, Bible Christianity, Christian living. They're not concerned about it at all. He said, just tears me up. He says, I tell you, even now, he said, I tell you, weeping. He says, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, you know what the context is? It's spiritual living for a Christian, for a Christian. Now, you can't imagine a Christian being an enemy of the cross of Christ. In words, they would not be. In words, they'd feel like Paul. God forbid that I should glory, save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Along the lines of comparing the world and earthly things to Bible Christianity, they become an enemy of the cross of Christ. Paul goes on to finish that verse in Galatians chapter 6. He says, uh, uh, glory in the cross of Christ. And he talks about the world being crucified unto me and I unto the world. And somebody that has only the world upon their heart and mind. You notice the thing, mind. Be thus minded. Verse 15, 16, let us mind the same thing. 19, again, mind earthly things. And somebody has only the earthly things on their mind. They become, now not in word, but they actually become an enemy of the cross of Christ. All right, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, 
whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You know what they are? They're idolaters. You know what they are? They made an idol out of the world and out of the things of this world. You know what they are? There's somebody who puts this world and the things of this world first, and Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary, they put it second behind that, whose end is destruction. All right, for a lost man and even for a saved man. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 5. You know what you have? You have somebody who's concerned only about right now. You have somebody...